Something very, very short. What you mean to test the mic? To yeah, is that good? Is that good? Is that good? What? A bit closer. Oh, yeah. It does come out, actually. I don't need to put this here. There. That's better. Yeah. Okay. There. I'll just, uh... <laughs>
Okay, uh, good morning. Um, it's uh, a slow start, of course. It's uh, Saturday morning, and that means it's uh, just been Friday night, and I think that's the reason why maybe people are still wandering up the, uh, up the, up the road. Um, so, but in a, we'll start in uh, two or three minutes, so I thought I'd just say a, a, few, a few practical things before we start, like, formally. Um, and maybe just go through the, the program, because it, it, it's not that it's complicated, but it uh, has to do with people either leaving or um, having to meet up or take bags and things. Um, as we are planning the first couple of hours, we'll be here, as you know, uh, with Lucy and with Charles, and I'll get back to that. Uh, who will like conclude formally, you might say, the uh, uh, the deliberations we've had on this on this theme, and uh, then we'll be taking um, a bus, or actually two buses. Uh, so at 11 o'clock, um, if we're on time, there'll be a short break, uh, and then we'll be going to the Alto University, which is not very far. It's a it's a, it's, it's a 10 minute drive, um, and at the university. Uh, we will be greeted by the um, uh, Group X, as they're called, um, and they will uh, show a or present a, 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 an exhibition, actually, which is from last August, and that's called Human Cities Challenging the City Scale, which is a European exhibition about uh, uh, projects, European projects, um, which are uh, looking at innov innovative ways of, um, you might say, placemaking and uh, working in, in urban situations. Um, then, after a couple of um, a couple of uh, presentations uh, by Anti Elba and uh, Ansi Yutsanaimi, uh, we will um, again uh, jump on the bus. This time with a uh, packed lunch, um, and we'll head for the central station to drop some of you off if you have to take uh, flights. And um, it is such that um, if we're there at 13:15, you can reckon on being at the airport at about uh, 1,400 hours. So if your plane is like around 1500, 1530, 16, you should take that kind of stop off to make it work. Anyway, hopefully the, the rest of us will be um, wandering around uh, uh, Kalastama. And um, this is the, uh, or is it called Fiskehamen? And this is the uh, harbor district in central, um, central Helsinki. And Stuba Nikola, and I don't know if Stuba is here, is he? Okay, Stuba Nicola, he said he would, uh, anyway, join us here and then uh, be on the bus. And uh, there will also be a uh, sort of short introduction on, on, on the bus, actually, as to why we are uh, visiting that area. Um, there'll be two or three stop-offs in, uh, in the area, and um, one of the uh, artists uh, who's been taking part here, um, the collective Raivi Bowman, will, has also organized some local you might say local activities, is a place she worked in collaboration with when she was doing her in situ art project uh, last year. They are preparing some buns and coffee and stuff. So um, it's the residents in the area. Um, so after that, uh, we hopefully will just pop by again the, um, uh, the, the, the main station. So that means we should be at the main station about 14:45, so that means you will be in the in the airport about 15:30. Uh, so you, if you have planes of uh, at 6, 17, or 18, you should take that stop off. Okay. Um, this is like a notice board, isn't it? Uh, then uh, we're at the Museum of Finnish Architecture, um, which is not a huge museum, but we have a space which is. Uh, let's put it this way. It'll be quite cosy. Um, I think they are. We're cramming uh, about uh, 70, 80 people. We have 110 signed up for the bus trip, which is really good. So we'll be 70 or 80 people, and there we're having a an informal roundup in a way. We'll also be looking at the exhibition they have, an informal roundup of this uh, of this lab. And um, um, I I'd, I'd kind of like you to think about if what you would like to to say what you have uh, gathered, not a sort of a whole reel off, um, you know, a long, a long sort of speech, but the main points of perhaps if you found there are things which were interesting and you will take with you. Um, we've also though, made sure there are some people who are really prepared. So we've asked Nicholas Weibrow, who is over there, um, professor of performing arts at Warwick uh, University to, to sort of be a, 
uh, a watchdog over the last few days and pick up some things which he has thought were relevant. Um, I've also asked Leah to make notes, as she has been in many of the sessions, also as moderator and also as speaker, to also make some notes. Um, and then I'd really love it if Jana Simula could also say something about what her perspectives are and what she has found interesting or relevant uh, for her. You should have said that yesterday evening. My mother has been taken to a hospital for um, fixing that. Oh, okay. Yeah, so well, I didn't know that, did I? Uh, I oh. I'm telling you no. I okay. didn't want to upset you. No, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, look, um, if, if, Luke, we can see. If you're there and you're still coherent, uh, you say something. If you're, if you're not, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of you and... Uh, and, and, you know, comfort you. Yeah. Okay? okay All right. Good. Okay. Okay. Um, then I'd like Lever, Lever, where are you? Lever, to also say something and perhaps also focus on these uh, new artistic, you might say, collective actions because there's been four of them actually presented and I think you followed them all about what you think is interesting there. Okay? Um, and then uh, we have uh, Evelina um, Hosea and, uh, and, and, and Pilvi also, and I think the two of you have made a presentation together, and the two of you are actually trying to start an association of, of cultural planning Finland, and you are sitting where? You're there, and you will also uh, come with some uh, comments as to what you found might be uh, relevant or daunting or interesting about uh, possible initiatives there. Um, so that will, like, you know, sort of start us off and from then I think we're going to just roll and see who would like to come with uh, supplementary or personal remarks or things we haven't touched on which were important you thought. So after that we're, we're opening the bottles and I actually I've forgotten to buy the bottles. Um, so on the way we'll drop up, we'll, we'll stop at a supermarket at one of the buses and we'll, we'll, we'll buy some bottles of wine and some peanuts okay. So we will do that. So that'll be bus number two I think. So I'll go in bus number two and buy the wine and peanuts um, and the juice. Okay, and that will be basically that. So we reckon on ending about four o'clock. We'll, the ones that want to hang around in the, in the museum can hang around until five. The others will jump on the bus and go to the central station, and that will be for the ones who are leaving like after eight o'clock in the evening. So that's the final stop. So three stops at the station. This is going to take all morning, isn't it? Um, then um, the, the bus will come back here. So if you're staying here like tonight, you don't have to worry about that. You're coming back here. So if you're leaving today, take your bags. If you're not leaving today, don't take your bags. Good. That's the very, very practical sort of you know, gritty nitty stuff. Um, and I think we're ready to start. We'll just check. Are you coming in? You're going that way, okay, good, okay, all right, okay. So, um, yeah. So in a way, actually, Lucy has, um, the title of this, uh, which Lucy Boulevard has prepared, is called Participatory Placemaking Visions into, Global, into Action Globally. Um, and in a way, it really does capture on uh, the, the, the sense of where we were yesterday evening, which was, which was in a way a, a, a significant point in this, in this, in this um, conference because uh, Franco Bianchini like, lifted the whole uh, discourse and lifted the whole, you might say, um, scale of this into a global scale, European global scale, and talked about what we were challenged by what was challenging us, not just with regards to, you might say, a narrow concept of placemaking, but actually, you might say, ethical, moral, political survival, in a way, because it seems that he uh, recounted so many threats to the way we were trying to uh, function, uh, modulate our cities, our lives, that he really try, did write, uh, sort of draw quite a, a sort of dystopian uh, picture. But um, from out of that, we seem to come with some sort of spirits. And I think it was right interesting that we had afterwards the presentation by Anthony and the Assemble uh, Collective, who in their own, in a way, naive, but actually completely authentic and believable 
fashion were trying to carve out their own platform in, you might say, a city which is a, any, of any, a global city, uh, London, and trying to manage in spite of, you might say, horrendous, uh, you might say, um, property prices and um, in a situation where it is very difficult to get public support where the Arts Council has been cut 40% of the grants, so it is a, a question of survival. And with, despite that, and uh, despite, you might say, um, the, the opportunity for some of them to be, to engage in more lucrative professions or to actually uh, just think individually, they're sticking together and they're trying to create a very collective, you might say, collective uh, future, which is also engaging citizens and engaging uh, poorer communities or less resourceful communities. And I think that was really a, 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 not so much an intellectual answer, but it's actually perhaps one of the answers as to how we could and ought to and are reacting. I mean, there are so many examples of, of artists or culturally led initiatives which are not just waiting and not just hoping, but actually are taking action and making decisions and stepping into the arena and actually doing things on small scales which have really big ideas and could have big consequences. So I think that was, in a way, a really good balance, having, you might say, a very, very, uh, a very, very not academic, but an overall and very a broad view and actually see the response by a group of young people who were really understanding that situation and coping with it and managing. So I think that was really very good. And so in a way, what I'm saying is actually that's where we are ending up in our, in our, in our discourse over the three days is this balance between participation, local placemaking, um, visioning, and actually thinking about what is the, what is the global context. So um, Lucy, I think it's very good that you came. You've been here for three days, so you've actually got to know what we're talking about and where our issues are. Um, so um, yeah, I'm very much looking forward to what you've got to say. So thank you, and you, you're ready to go. Thank you very much, Trevor. It's a real pleasure to be here, to have been invited to such a, such a cosmopolitan milieu in Finland. My second time in nine months, and I spoke at the University of Tampere, uh, and third time in Finland, all at, moreover, all together, um, including going and having dinner at the bottom of a mine outside Helsinki during the, the, the world design capital, which was a very... Um, not, uh, not a part, well, it was a participatory experience, I think, the sense of trust. If the lift broke down, we would need to really rely on each other um, heavily. So um, uh, the, um, the American um, humorist, the writer Mark Twain, uh, advocated making your uh, vacation your vocation. No, your vocation your vacation. Two ways. I've made it my vocation to define priorities and strategies for both um, adaptive planning and placemaking. And participatory placemaking can also be defined as somehow a sense of situating yourself as a citizen, as a, as a citizen of the world or of your, your town, your city, your neighborhood. So um, I don't like to get too hung up over particular um, terminologies, but I think I like to explore the multiple meanings of the, the particular words that we use and see if I can find more, uh, if not contradictions, we'll find more resolutions that are satisfying. So um, I do a lot of desk research, but the vacation um, involves interviews abroad, uh, all over the world, investigative research trips to find out I mean, I'm, I'm noticing what's not working, but I'm really, up my, my campaign, my goal is to find things that are really working and, and investigate why, why they're working so well. Um, so I tell stories about my discoveries in my books. So here is the uh, magazine uh, AD, which I guest edited last year, 4D Hyperlocal, which is about the way in which we can use geolocal um, technologies 
and other digital related sensors and actuators in a, in a way which is very compatible with communities' uh, aspirations for themselves. And uh, I also wrote um, a book which won an award called Mass Planning Futures, which was about turning upside down the whole um, tired, tired uh, um, modernist master planning condition, which is really top down and uh, uh, abstracts not only the green field, but uh, runs the risk of huge social dislocation. And that uh, was a five year research project. Then more recently, I wrote together with Thomas Omicora, the Danish-Italian pa uh, participatory placemaker. He does this full time. He, he doesn't write books because they're very time consuming. <laughs> um, uh, this book, which he came to me and said, we want to, um, I need you to, to help me because I can't write. And I said, you can write perfectly well. Um, just speak. And then, and then we'll work it out together. And we, w we really were a, a, an equitable, balanced, democratic uh, team. If anybody would like to have a look at it, it's got uh, 42 case studies, or rather, I would say, stories of projects around the world, rather than the more sort of dry and technical case studies. I mean, there are actually a lot of uh, statistics in there as well and heavily supported by brand new infographics which we uh, we commissioned from uh, the uh, design surgery to illuminate processes which i think is so so important yeah sure yeah so yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so and then um i a few years ago, when I had a bit of spare money, I set up my own web scene out of frustration with the lack of, uh, uh, d well, the diminishing opportunities within the, the print media for independent voices and journalism. And uh, Urbanista is being relaunched after Easter with a um, new issue, um, online and physical, um, sustainable urbanism's new directions, which is specifically aimed, focused on the drylands of the of the Gulf. Um, here's my doppelganger, who's busy Anna Grichting, who's a Swiss architect, who and professor at Qatar University, and as we speak, she's busily doing photo opportunities, um, <laughs> or has been, and they're all on on Instagram um, with various prominent politicians and industrialists, because. It, it is a very, very, it's a tough call to promote sustainable urbanism in, um, uh, in dialogue with certain characters within the Middle East. Um, but what is so gratifying is to know that there are increasing numbers of sympathizers and people of prominent, with, with prominence who are really entirely on, on our side, which is a very good move, very good thing to know. So I also... Um, curate participatory projects around the world, um, together with local and international collaborators, uh, architects and placemaking specialists, and occasionally artists. So more on that shortly. Um, but this whirlwind of cross-cultural activity, it also uh, fertilizes my consultancy work, which is, where is it? Here, yeah. Here, yeah. Um, I work as a place vision strategist for a local authority in the north of London, Enfield Council. And we're working in Edmonton, which is not only one of the poorest boroughs in London, but in, in the whole of the UK. Um, it's a post-industrial area. And the, the council has fallen out already. I should rephrase that more diplomatically, but um, the council has a very strong ethical vision for equitable, equitable growth. And it therefore is... Uh, doing that through various means of promoting um, more high pay, a diversified economy with higher paid jobs um, and also incubating a new cultural quarter, cultural cluster. There is already building blocks, the open um, maker workshop on the site, and this is their organic cafe, and uh, they um, are in answer to the, the woman who asked Anthony about the network yesterday, there is an open lab, uh, there is an open um, maker workshop network in London. If you just look, look up open maker workshop, you'll, you'll find it. Building Blocks is the most furthest north in London. There are about 
goodness, there are more than 20, but every single one is vitally needed as a community resource. And uh, this is a brand new children's uh, play space, playground, um, play park, moreover, that, that the, this, these are three children amongst a group of about 10 who co-designed their own park and it had its soft media launch just, just last week, which is very, um, very exciting. So it takes a whole lecture to unpack such a, such a thing. <laughs> But uh, Enfield owns 64% of the land already, so they do already have far more, uh, let's say, uh, muscle to, to, uh, to make things happen in, on their own terms, which is very gratifying. So, um, so who said it first? And I'm sure somebody said this before the, um, uh, Jan Gale came along, but um, first life, then spaces, then buildings, the other way around never works. Um, now, Jan, who with his psychologist wife Ingrid began researching Italian cities in the early 1960s, um, explored, as you will all uh, probably know very well, it, it, how people really use public spaces and how they really interacted with each other in different con contexts. Um, I've been doing, this is a set of their notebooks, and uh, memorabilia. I've been doing the same with places that I've visited, um, making illustrated diaries um, since I was a, a child. And uh, I can um, I never get tired of such a thing. So and I never get tired of asking questions either. Um, so one of the key questions in Master Planning Futures was, uh, why is it that urban plans and human life are so often, uh, on a practical basis, um, antithetical entities with one rigidly imposing itself on the intricate um, organic ecosystems of the other? Um, growing urbanisation and deteriorating ecosystems affecting cities and their regions make them, as we know, the nexus of mankind's challenges and opportunities. Top-down master planning and conventional policy making are just not dis de delivering the systemic changes needed to secure better living conditions for the 90%. And uh, amongst the high priorities, social uh, equity, environmental conservation, there's a whole heap of them. Um, surely the perspectives uh, and the sense of cultural memories and the narratives of city dwellers across all generations count for far more than they're being given credit for at the moment. Um, and we have to find alternatives in crises and uh, dig ourselves out of them. Uh, and also to alternatives to the extreme centralization of power, finance, political and administrative decisions governing the development of urban areas. The exclusion of citizens from uh, territorial and urban management um, in favor of financial and political elites. So participatory placemaking um, and cultural co-creation combining top-down and bottom-up strategies, and, and in the middle, crucially, creating a solid core in the middle as well, so that it doesn't remain a, a void, uh, engages citizens in, in advancing um, their visions for their cities and towns, teasing them out if they claim they don't have particularly a clear vision. Um, everyone has has aspirations, and it supports their well-being through localised design and self-governance, and it regulates, uh, sorry, it regenerates, opposite to re regulate, it regenerates neighbourhoods affected by financial and social <laughs> segregation. So with individuals and groups at the heart of urban renewal, we can grow the value of social and cultural capital, and we can build uh, resilience from the ground up out of the often overlooked existing assets and resources in communities through a range of innovative uh, approaches. So here, for example, is South African architect Michael Hart, uh, Hart's generative proposal for versatile new street market infrastructure in Coronationville in Johannesburg. And it enables local people to trade close to they, where they live rather than having to, to travel for two hours a day in and two hours a day 
back to their informal se settlements. And these kind of low-cost adaptable interventions, they help to formalize the, uh, it formalize the informal sector, as uh, the architect Hubert Klumpner, the co-founder of Urban Think Tank, puts it. And they maximize the possibility of social, economic, and environmentally sustainable um, places, more equitable, more open-hearted, and inclusive. So the, the rise of the human rights movement in the 20th century that we talk about in our book at the beginning, um, all the, the, the very weighty stuff, well, it's all quite weighty, but we, we try to start very early in the history of human settlements and go right through to the present day. Um, that gave participatory practices a real uh, trajectory of influence. Um, and in, in our book, we discuss those times in history when questions of human agency were hotly debated by philosophers and other politically inclined individuals. But for a very uh, marvelous contemporary classic um, encompassing this impetus, 2013, I recommend Handmade Urbanism from Community Initiatives to Participatory Models by the German architect uh, Uta Weiland, who was deputy director of the Alfred Herrhausen Society in Berlin, together with the Brazilian architect Marcus Rosa. So books with titles like The Just City, The Endless City, uh, The Rational City, they make it clear just what effort has gone into making cities in ways that don't put human life first. Um, so when I first came to research the, the book, uh, I, I found very few extensive publications vividly um, and with, with illustrations explaining examples of processes and very few supported um, by, by such, uh, such means. Now, uh, Marcus Rosa, who's one of our, the subjects, one of our stories, um, he's worked for the last six years in Sao Paulo and, and in Rio, where he's carried out extensive mapping to better understand the identities and the correspondences between things, including existing and uh, potential networks of communication. He quotes along the way the psychologist and human rights activist Nom Fundo Waleza, who says solutions to problems germinate in, in the communities rather than in the boardrooms. Now, we might think that's a no-brainer in many respects. And the graphic of Roses here bears out his belief that activating stakeholders at different levels allows for the formation of more complex complex participatory models, complex but, um, but better equipped to tackle the challenges to hand through partnerships that negotiate a common base and also open, open doors for development. So for his project Edificio Unayo in Sao Paulo, creating um, uh, affordable housing near to the, in, to, in the close, uh, close to the city centre, he and his collaborator, Christine Stephanie, set in process, um, set in train a process which had far-reaching consequences. And here's our, uh, one of our, di our in infographics to try and illuminate what the series of uh, decisions that were made at different steps along the way. Uh, small yet critical decisions. Um, so firstly, choosing an uncompleted high-rise, abandoned by some developer, deciding to retrofit it. Uh, second, cleaning the abandoned concrete frame and installing necessary amenities for living, uh, creating a semi-public area at the back for, for recreation set back from the plot edge. Um, and uh, then... At this point, media interest was triggered in the project and 30 engineering tra trainees offered to help out. Then students from the Faculty of Architecture got involved and members of the community, people who wanted to live there, people who lived nearby who were interested. So we, we visualized the sequence of choices um, made supporting the validity of an alternative future for the building. So 42 families were, were housed in this scheme. Um, a mix of low-income, disabled, and elderly residents. 
And the consequences of the social capital built were many. So by mixing the urban populations, it helps combat Sao Paulo's high inequality and segregation. By using existing building stock and reducing public spending, it maximizes value for landlords. And then it makes best use of a central location closer to residents' jobs. So again, they don't have to spend four hours uh, traveling on buses. Cutting commuting times. and provides an alternative to slum dwelling, the better quality of life with more dignity and less violence. And there is very often no alternative to creating a viable alternative of, to equitable growth. Um, Amstel 3, um, a mono functional office district in the southeast of Amsterdam with a high vacancy level. Um, and it, if you were to go to Rotterdam, you'd see many of those uh, office buildings around the station are scarcely occupied today. Um, so dying, dying. And the city municipality of Amsterdam failed to get the investment to do anything about it through top-down means. Um, you know, re urban regeneration after the global economic crisis. So they, um, so they handed over the challenge to a Dutch urban designer called Saskia Beer, who's written an essay in my 4D hyperlocal publication all about it. And this highly integrated, um, this highly integrated and actionable online transformation. Here we go. We're wrong. Yeah, looked ahead. Um, transformation das dashboard that she created enables citizens, businesses, organizations, and the government to directly exchange data and ideas and to collectively plan for change to the district on their own terms. And so the, the dashboard was part of what she called the Zoe City Initiative in, involving many, many other offline, commun offline community activities face-to-face -face that she pioneered. So we need alternatives. Um, and if we only talk about density and qual uh, quantitative, quantitative measures, like um, a number of architects and moreover, almost, um, well, me very, very many developers do, we risk overlooking the opportunity to catch up. Um, sorry, we overlook the opportunity to catch and steer which is something I think that good architects do very well in, within society, something richer, social interaction. Um, so the Guatemalan architect, Teddy Cruz, uh, who works amidst the poverty of Chuana across the border in Mexico in the space between the top down and the, and the grassroots, um, uh, not so long ago called for a new system of measuring the success of a city. Why could urban quality not be based on density of population or on the value of turnover and rent, which is the language of de developers, but on the frequency of social transactions? Now, that's an alternative. I mean, just talking more doesn't mean to say you're, um, anything meaningful will necessarily <laughs> arise, but uh, the, the breaking down of barriers, transcending... Um, transcending obstacles. That's an alternative. That, that is a vision. And it's not vital, but alternatives very often work when they're based on credible cross-sectoral strategies, lateral strat strategies, have a so this solid core that I talked about. The um, Colombian architect Camille Calderon, whose PhD, Politicizing po uh, Participation, when he examines the gap between theory and practice in the field, he makes the essential point that although participatory processes can have highly beneficial results, naturally this depends on the precise social, political, economic processes and dynamics of the context in question. So we have to map a locality's resources it, it, with some profundity and the means, means of access to them, regulations, the other procedures that are already in place, um, as well as specific identities of civil organizations and other groups of people wishing to play a role in placemaking, but with their own agendas as well that have to be scrutinized. So how can you harness the processes and dynamics of context in a meaningful way? Lu I mean, there is a 
only a very big answer to this, but one, uh, two things, three things is using local materials, drawing out local knowledge, resources and enthusiasm to really institute change that creates a legacy that local people themselves can take ownership of and do something with after architects, designers, planners, artists, placemakers, workshop leaders leave inevitably. And it's a recipe that genuinely uh, helps further their self-determination. Now, I don't claim to have all the answers, but with my collaborators, I make, um, as a curator, I make fast-track projects, low budgets, shoestring budget projects, um, bringing to pe people together who've never experienced architecture and design um, activities before, if, or if they have, and they may be experts in making. They've never worked in a, they've never been in a workshop environment uh, with, with their colleagues or their friends or uh, people they don't know to create something new that will represent something about themselves as opposed to something for their bosses and how they perceive their relationships with their citizen neighborhoods is a, is a theme that is very important. So, um, and uh, here are some students from the universities of Shenzhen and Hong Kong, University, uh, Hong Kong collaborating with fashion textile workers in, in the city of Shenzhen on symbolic hanging textiles. And I have to say that this is um, partly thanks to the Norwegian government that we were able to do this project because they're very interested in participatory projects. And my collaborator, Alex Farunas, is a, is a young Norwegian architect. So we, and here are three um, workers that we collaborated with, the, and they were, curate, they were, they were in a co-creation situation for an exhibition called Remake, We Make, Frameworks for Social and Cultural Exchange. 2015-16. So I made it together with um, two Norwegian architects, Alex Farunes and Eva Tutteren, and Chinese architects known as Dot A, who also teach. And, uh, and it was held partly, or well, the outcome was held, at the Shenzhen Biennale of Architecture and Urbanism in China's Pearl River Delta. Now, textiles as a medium have a long tradition of communicating cultural or social meaning within different communities around the world. And as we know, in society today, the absolute sheer speed of the fashion industry has transformed textiles into a commodity, a product to be bought and sold. And similarly, the, pe the role of people who, um, who produce these commercialized textiles has become increasingly invisible in, in this process. So we were working in a, with a small uh, fashion, a small knitted fashion textiles factory in Shenzhen. Um, and as part of the world factory, if you like, it produced clothes for the likes of, or it still does, for H&M and Zara. Um, we worked with 11 factory workers, and one of whom was their boss, with very, very flat management, and it was like a family environment. So for the past 20, 30 years, each one has had a specific role on the production line. So during the workshop, each of the factory workers designed and made one individual textile artifact, a hanging, which we then ha hung in the old um, converted flower factory that the Shenzhen Biennale had on this, uh, had as its, for its venue. Um, this artifact meant something very personal to them. It evolved from that dialogue, that process of, of thinking, communicated a message, moreover, that they wanted to share with the world. And so the Biennale, the fla flower factory, as it was before, we were lucky we got a space next door the, to the Victoria and Albert Museum's exhibition, which was good. And it featured five uh, architectural groups from UK, the UK and, and Norway, which was Alex Ivar and our British collaborator Clementine Blakemore. So there was... Um, uh, first of all, the visibility that it was manifested as a film compilation by our film director, Paul McHale. We had Assemble, um, at the time they won the uh, Turner Prize, Workshop, Studio Weave, and Zero Zero Architecture, and Carl Turner Architects, all of whom 
if you were to check out the sites um, and you know a lot about Assemble now, are, um, are very committed to a social, socially uh, driven vision of architecture. So uh, we, um, we also needed a local partner, so we teamed up with two, uh, the two founders of, co-founders of Dot Architecture who are also professors. So in advance of the workshop, we spent months trying to find scouring Shenzhen looking for recycled materials, which are actually quite expensive to buy, trying to find the right local partners and a venue that wouldn't be in the, in the institution of the Biennale, but would be somewhere else. So with a couple of months to go, we honed in on um, um, an urban village in Shenzhen, and uh, so many Chinese cities have urban villages. It's called Beishizu. It's one of the biggest in Shenzhen. And as an urban home to many migrants from across the Pearl River Delta and, the Chi and China more widely, it has a really uh, it's a wide socio-demographic mix. Um, many urban villages here in the Pearl River Delta, they're dense conglomerates of different people from all over China with lots of different building typologies. And they... Um, they are considerably more informal as, as communities and places than the more developed, more recently developed parts of the city, which are full of more monumental, um, uh, comp compartmentalized, single uh, formal elements. And many of these, the urban villages are rich with different areas, uh, different activities and cultures. So we wanted to celebrate Beishizu's innate openness, organic, the organic organisation, the diversity, the multi-party negotiation that went on, um, like as in most urban villages, that have a real value for people um, because they can live so close to their home and uh, to uh, live so close to their work and avoid a more you know suburban commuting kind of uh, in context environment way of life. So um, several of these areas in China are experiencing gentrification. And the urban villages have been considered dangerous and illegal, fueled by bad media stories, but mostly because they're located quite centrally um, and have a high land value. So the goal was to demolish 20% in Shenzhen by 2010. It was met with really strong community resistance. And Dafun, uh, urban village in Shenzhen, which supports the art industries, uh, was successfully presented as a very, a very good example of revitalization, revitalization, and has not been demolished at all. So Beishizu is made up of five villages, which are starting to be demolished. In the northern section, it began in 2016, and more demoli demolitions are scheduled for 2018. Um, it's a typical situation in Shenzhen's population shot up from 300,000 to 20 million. So what's interesting is that the Biennale this year, this is this, now we have on the subsequent one, has actually been held in Shenzhen's urban villages for the first time with the theme of coexistence so that the curators could examine how people from different backgrounds and social classes can coexist in the city and how to diversify communities in the process of urbanization. So we before, um, uh, back, at, back at the time we made the project, the students were with the workers for 12 days. Uh, writing down their stories and assisting them designing their, the pattern of their own hanging textile. Um, and in the end, the students learned how to knit and, and make quite a lot of textiles themselves. So joining this big family, they could also begin, begin to understand their hardship and difficulties. And many of the workers left China, places in China for Shenzhen to work far away from their hometowns, and they're only allowed to go back, only in a position to go back during the spring festival once a year to see their families. Um, but uh, in our fa factory, the manager didn't consider himself to be above anyone else, which, and uh, did all kinds of tasks, menial tasks, which was gratifying. Um, so what made this project work? The very personal nature of the process proved to be a catalyst in building relationships among the factory workers of a new kind and inspiring some to receive training and engage in other aspects of textile production. And uh, it was because it was cross-sectoral, it inspired others to engage with the factory group. 
in Shenzhen there is a brand new design museum called Design Society run by the Dutch uh, curator writer Ola Bauman. Um, and now the factory workers are making another exhibition with them, which is a rare collaboration in China between an institution and an industrial outfit, between professional curators and industrial workers. So low budget, but really satisfying. And as um, the uh, architect um, based at University of Hong Kong, jo Joshua Bolshova, has commented about China's urban villages. Uh, they serve as urban incubators and potentially advantageous test sites for experimental planning policies, such as new environmental regulations or incentives for people to build with improved access to light and air. So in our project, we consider as a social incubator within this mold. So the, uh, the other project I want to tell you about is, uh, was also um, one that involved Alex Farunas, who did all the work on the ground. Um, and it involved an immigrant group living in the city of Sao Paulo. Um, uh, it was to, a project that we did with Goma Oficina, um, who are a little bit like a, a Brazilian equivalent to Assemble. I, I don't know if there are as many as, uh, is it 18 of them, but um, they're very multi uh, disciplinary in their in their talents as well. Uh, Maria Cow Levy was both an art is an artist and an architect who, together with Alex, did a lot of work. And this collaborative project we staged within the 11th Sao Paulo Biennale of Architecture la just last autumn. Um, the Biennale was founded in '73, and it's one of the most important exhibitions in um, uh, in Latin America promoting innovation in architecture. So we worked with eight members of the CAMI Migrant Support Centre uh, based in Sao Paulo, with the Sao Paulo Metro, um, very supportive, and with the University Mackenzie School of Architecture who made the film about the project. So Rosa, Marcus Rosa, the Brazilian architect that I've referred to before, he directed the, um, the Biennale this time giving it the theme of M Proyeto in project. Um, and he accepted our, our proposed project because it really closely matched his vision for his Biennale, which was to re explore creative bottom-up processes um, in the making of global, um, of making global cities like Sao Paulo and to give ordinary people a voice. So it's a long established cultural platform and the whole event took place in different public urban spaces, not in, in art galleries or institutional museums. So the culmination of our project saw the display of six uh, pattern banners, each with individual slogans in different metro stations on the red line of the network, uh, which is actually one of the youngest in the world, but also one of the most modern. And uh, the groups chose specifically the busiest lines, line in the system, which carries 4.7 million passengers a day, that is also used by a large number of immigrants. So we centered uh, front, uh, Frontiera Livre, um, which means fr free, uh, free frontier, um, around the compelling theme of borders. Over the last decade, the number of immigrants to Brazil has increased by 160%, with some 9.8 million inhabitants. Sao Paulo, the largest city in Brazil, is a natural magnet for immigrants. Um, predictably, creating a new life is very, very hard. We have to reorganize ourselves. Who, who am I? Where do I come from? Um, each of us has our story, but it's the story of all of us that predominates, explained one of the participants. The group's members had come from Bolivia, Peru, Angola, um, Angola Haiti, um, the Congo, and had crossed into the border, across the border into Brazil, but had regularly faced invisible borders, uh, as you can imagine, of a cultural, social, and economic nature. 
And we, um, before planning the banners, each person shared their personal experiences and stories since arriving in the, in the country, including inevitably a lot of negative experience. But going through what you have to, you just have to laugh, was um, quite a common refrain. So the banners were approved by the Metro, um, which already regularly exhibits artwork in, inside different stage, stations. And each one was chosen for uh, an individual slogan. So in um, Republica, you had Leave Fear Aside. Um, these don't entirely match up, but um, leave fear aside because as participant Claudine explained, here you can find all kinds of people and you can get really scared. So in the area around it Itakera station where people live in a particularly vulnerable condition, the barrier the, the banner in, encouraged immigrants to dream while, while at Tawa Appe it was about the importance of having strength to just continue. So the symbols on the banners included strength depicted as a snowball, a weighing meat machine of justice, a megaphone, uh, a square that had been broken through, an open eye, and, and many more. So how did the professionals and the members of the group share their work? Well, Alex explained, we, ex we uh, provided the thematic framework for them, and then the, the stories and the choices of the patterns and symbols came from the migrants themselves. They also made the banners, as you can see, and each of them with their own printed pattern with four lines, a words, and a symbol. They were beautiful, um, and he said that after all the work, they really had a clear idea of what the symbols should be. So the project also demonstrated very effectively how participatory practices can bring together specific and diverse groups of people through common goals and through psychological drivers. By exploring creative expression through the sense of togetherness, the participants told us that they overcame feelings of isolation and felt more empowered to deal with, with urban life. Uh, they gain new creative and technical skills that they can use in positive and constructive ways on a smaller or even same scale or even larger scale on future occasions. But it, perhaps, you know, in their own living spaces, community centres and, and places of recreation. And Goma Officina has worked with CAMI with uh, immigrants before and, and has a and CAMI has a strong track record in providing valuable orientation to immigrants. However, facilitating them to tell their collective stories through statements and symbols was um, the first of its kind. And it proved how participatory design and dialogue can strengthen a sense of urban citizenship from something fragile to something much more solid. Il faut qu'on prenne précaution. Milia, moi, tu es Milo. M'en bais jamais, dis-moi, il est chez mon nom. Milo, dis-moi, fais attention, mon nom. La jalousie qui fait mon divague. Milia, moi, tu es Milo. Ou dans le pays, toute bagaille, c'est magie. Milo, dis-moi, fais attention, mon nom. M'en bais jamais, dis-moi, il est chez mon nom. Milia, moi, tu es Milo. Je 
Okay, so how can I finish off? Alternative strategies for urban placemaking cannot be both socially driven and beneficial through a distance top-down approach with minimal or um, uh, let's say cynical, only cynical public consultation can't be cynical. Um, the newer participatory marshalling processes create test beds of a very valuable nature for enhancing the practices of, um, of planning and placemaking by making public interests, innovative sustainable design and green infrastructure um, the objectives. Taking responsibility for genuine livability gives social capital a high, very high priority, non-negotiable. The work hinges on citizen activism and an interdependent relationship between the expert placemaker and the amateur user of places. And I don't use the word amateur in any kind of pejorative way. Um, the, the, the citizen, we are all a citizens. Um, we all live in cities or towns or in peri-urban rural areas. Um, we all take part. And so it entails the continuous discovery of human beings, adaptive sensibilities and capacities, as well as the potential of the places themselves and drawing out that potential in the best possible ways. Thank you. And if anyone would like to have a quick look at, this is a prototype. This is a special book that I'm writing and preparing after lots of interviews with everybody uh, for Enfield Council. Um, it's a place book, a unique place in the making. It's not a sales brochure. It's its own genre. Uh, it's um, a charter of principles and thematic strategies for making um, Meridian Water, the 85 hectare site, post-industrial site in Edmonton, a place that is a place that truly is sustainable of equitable growth. And this is to be used as a tool by all the uh, professional uh, participants in the project. It's something, aid memoir, to, um, uh, to show to all the developers that we'll be working with, architects, um, will refer to it. Everyone has, is, should see their own ideas and their own beliefs reflected within this, which is why uh, it's gone through a process of wonderfully unruly democracy, because it's uh, both in as a word document and as a, as a layout, um, nearly 162 pages, has been um, commented on by people about 10 times now in 10 processes, almost 
I thought I would never see it at the end, but this is nearly, we are nearly at the stage and we'll be launching it in London at the GLA, Greater London Authority, in, in May. So I can give you a quick look if anyone wants to have a look. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, it really some uh, compelling and convincing e examples, I think. Uh, are there any comments or questions, or reflections on that? Yes, if you'd like to. Uh, hello. Uh, my, my question's about um, the. So, people normally who are at the sort of strategy planning, master planning, uh, but you know, the, the design end, aren't often the people that go and actually physically work with the participants. Um, you know, there's a kind of element of hands-on, if you like, dirty work, uh, you know, literally getting your hands dirty. Mm. Um, in the work you've been doing, is, is, are they the same people or is there a distance between the people? I mean, you're, you've described doing desk research and obviously going yeah. to meetings and all those kinds of things takes yeah. up a lot of time. Yeah. Do you go and directly work with the communities that you're, you know, how, do, how does that work, in other words, that joining yeah. up? Well, um, well with a the division of labor with myself and Alex um, uh, because he's done a lot of, he's led a lot of workshops he was the one doing them on the ground working with directly with students but I have been a professor and I have taught and I have taken students on field trips but we just made that pra pragmatic decision that it was in our best interest that we each uh, diversify what we were doing but I, I think um, I could stand in for Alex with a little bit, you know, a little bit of um, yeah. work, and he could stand in for me because he's been getting grants for his work. He does post-disaster reconstruction projects in the Philippines and other places, um, and he's used to going to lots of agencies to get funding and support and and so on. But um, when it comes to the bigger picture of architects and planners more generally. Um, everyone is their own, everyone is an individual and everyone is using their best capacities to, to, be, pro to be productive and creative and make a positive um, uh, impact within society. And it is, it is true that many architects are not particularly at all interested in being participatory placemakers. They're not, they don't really relish the public consultation that is, is required as part of um, uh, projects where you, you have to meet with people and they, uh, they feel stung if they get negative feedback. But I mean, uh, I wouldn't be so sympathetic because I think architects also rather now, they're very used to having negative comments, but they, um, s some prefer to keep a more distanced relationship with, um, with people on the ground um, because I think possibly also they have seen projects be, be stopped or if there is an element of controversy. But I, I can't so much speak for them in their own consciences, but I think the fact is that the, there are younger, a younger generation of architects are spectacularly good at doing social projects. Mm. I've noticed that they come as facilitators and they come with multiple skills uh, as Alex and Maria do. Everything from you know, making sets to graphic design, like like assemble, mm. and they don't, they uh, they are really curious and keen to learn and so on, and um, are not. Um, I mean, there are community planners. The 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 man who facilitated the ladyship ch um, uh, children's play park in Edmonton, Phil Heaton, is the landscape architect and a community facilitator. So he's the one that has worked with the school children um, for two years. And he set up competition for them and so on. Um, and and they, they look to him. They Probably the first time that they ever really met and got to know an architect. So he's, he stands in their eyes as the image of what an architect is really gonna be. They, they they don't need to read about Ian Rand Rand or or um, Corbusier necessarily. <laughs> it's you know it's someone he, human in the flesh in front of them who's helping them, 
and inspiring them to cre create their own badly needed play space. Yeah. Okay, thank you. One thing was, uh, I think, um, uh, very strategically anyway, very daring, you might say, is the, the last project where you showed that the... Uh, um, the work was mm. actually presented in the, you might say, the main metro stations where you're in contact with potentially four million people a day, yeah. uh, where you're stepping into the public space, where it's very clear that this could also be either interpreted or misinterpreted as a, as a, a political action or, um, or an, a, a, an aggressive an aggressive step in which you're going into and creating a, I suppose, a, 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 you're, you're losing control of actually the work, because how it gets interpreted and how it gets misused and discussed and whatever mm. and, uh, and uh, the social media and newspapers, were you, are you aware of when you do that you are actually in the public space and it may create turmoil or discontent or disruptions? And were the people you engage, the immigrants, aware that they are actually doing that? How do you, how do you, because that's one thing I've always actually doing a, 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 a you might say, in a, a similar kind of project where we had a hundred refugees uh, telling their stories, mm. but then their stories become public, and are they, are they um, equipped uh, to answer, to, to, to discuss, to, uh, in the public discourse. How did you think about that and did you manage it at all or did you say no it's a work of art, it stands there, it can be interpreted, how it's interpreted we don't care, we don't uh, either protect it or, or, um, or um, you might say support it. How do you deal with that? Um, that's a very good question. I think that's a question that maybe that Marcus Rosa as the director of the Sao Paulo Biennale could better answer because he, he, after all, will, he has experienced uh, all the projects that he staged in public spaces throughout the whole period of the Biennale. Um, I mean, if you think of our London Metro, when do you ever see, you, do, you don't see uh, art works per se, you see very creative ad advertisements. Mm. Mm. Um, you rarely see graffiti because the moment someone comes up with an aerosol can, they're going to get um, uh, uh, escorted away. <laughs> so, you know, our, uh, at least in the sub subterranean lines anyway. But uh, uh, that's a really good point. Whether they would feel intimidated or empowered by, I think, probably some nervousness if there were to be some public forum actually in the station. Um, I think that it was programmed to avoid such direct confrontation with people who might be adversarial. That's for sure. that, that that's definitely going to be the case. Um, uh, you know, when there are planning appeals, and they always allow they allow members of the community to come and give their views, mm. and they're given a very short window of time to mm. say, say what they think, mm. and. Mm. Um, Sometimes they're hugely, they're hugely fed up and uh, irate, and they. But the process only allows them to speak for a limited time. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I don't, I don't know whether Marcos is interested in getting generating a bit of a kind of steam of, of aggressiveness, or I think it's fair to say probably like to keep it at arm's distance. But nonetheless, there is a case, you know, it's a bit like, I didn't want to mention Brexit, but um, it's painful. I'm a, a completely, completely devout Remainer. It's a religion to be a Remainer um, in the EU for me. But, um, and it's been very painful having discussions with family members and friends who are um, pro-Brexit. And when you're on Facebook, you can have discussions about Brexit with all your pals, and everyone is similarly irate about the, the whole Brexit thing in the first place. But I sometimes, I, I wonder, I think sometimes there is, there is a value in Remainers speaking to Brexiters to try to see, get to the bottom of motivations. Well, I just think it was a very brave, anyway, statement to have, a very bold statement yeah. to actually make in this... Uh, obviously very public space and to, to actually take the chance and the yeah. risk that I think that's what we often lack in a way because it was obviously very authentic mm. it wasn't uh, you might say in a way professional it wasn't advertising it wasn't information it was actually mm. uh, quite a, a, a statement okay yes 
Yeah, thank you, Lucy, for a very illuminating presentation. Really, very, very lot of very thought provoking. Um, I was thinking that we have been <clears throat> having a very uh, like um, uh, I think important points uh, during these days about. Uh, going uh, from beyond nice to, to uh, actually creating, uh, like having a political comment or, 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 or a catalyzing change. And uh, Lina pointed out a beautiful expression, how to get the learnings, the, the, the understanding of what comes out of it into the so-called bloodstream of the cities, actually into the system again. Uh, in your experience of uh, Shenzhen and, and, uh, and uh, Sao Paulo, how did the municipalities approach you? Did you was their interest, was their interaction of, of what, you, what, what this project in a way taught and how did it continue in the more, um, let's say, structure, structural uh, uh, municipality of the city? Um, well, because we were working like Russian dolls within a larger Russian doll of the, of the Biennales in both cases, um, the direct um, relationships were between, obviously, the local municipality and the Biennale organizations themselves. Now, I know in the case of Sao Paulo, Marcos Rosa has, um, has good contacts with the municipality and with um, political figures throughout, throughout the city. Um, I mean, the, the uh, political situ situation in the macro sense is somewhat more, is, is, is not so favorable. Um, but there are always individual. I think curators do uh, do themselves justice when they seek out individual, positive, um, uh, sympathetic, supportive political figures. In the case of Anna Grichting, who makes it her business to know everybody, um, to to engender because it's such a learning experience, so educational. You can listen to what they have to say as well. Create a, uh, create a threshold of understanding. In the case of Shenzhen, I think um, um, Shenzhen Biennale uh, is the the organisation is young and very go ahead, and it's co co it's uh, largely funded by a big developer doing all kinds of things, and the team they're very used to. Um, Two hours before the press view, the, the whole venue is um, visited by the people who come to check that there are no elements of the texts or the visuals that are construed to be um, um, uh, political in a way that they, the government doesn't like. And then certain things are taken out always. So there's a, a bit of a joke amongst the architects that if you overstep the line and you're never really going to know what you've done that might be too much, that your thing is just unceremoniously stripped off. But in our case, we had our video with barely, we, well, it's got talking on it, but it hasn't got text. And uh, uh, we, we installed our hangings um, halfway through. So our show, our installation was quite minimal quite experiential with the video and uh, our book available. And then at a certain point, we, uh, we installed our hangings. Um, and, the, and the hangings themselves had, as you could see, had attachments, the, the little um, papers explaining in Chinese what the whole project was about. Um, and there's a deep meaning, but people came with their families and the children played underneath and inside the hangings and so on. So um, we had people from Design Society, the new design museum, and, and there are politicians who are there in Shenzhen who are very much in favor of that. But Chinese policy within Shenzhen about promoting design as uh, design capacities amongst people I think perhaps we're in a, and Ola Bauman, the Dutch director of Design Society, would, is totally in, on, of this mind that there are ways and ways you can play uh, complex political conditions to your advantage, so that you you mitigate uh, the elements that don't work in your favour and draw out the the ones the elements that are going to give you some support. 
I mean, the, 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 the significant thing, or one significant thing is, of course, if these, these particularly with the, uh, the visual arts being alien, they are extending their remit to actually be the whole city. So in a way, you might say they are also uh, defining a new, a new cultural space. So within that, they have a certain amount of power and a certain amount of resilience and opportunity to actually have, not determine, but actually have influence the way the, the city is, is developing and thinking. I think that stepping outside of, uh, you might say, uh, building bound institutions into, into the city is, is, of course, a major trend, mm. and that reflects it. Um, and that, perhaps, um, might lead us on to the next thing, So it's, because in a way it's all about understanding the psychology of the city and how to, uh, how to work with the psychology of the city, which is uh, one of Charles's recent uh, books and perhaps something he will, he will touch on. So I'd like to say thank you very much to Lucy thank and you. then we'll try to ensure that Charles thank doesn't you. collapse here. Now, okay. do we want uh, a one minute uh, break just to sort of get sorted? And no more than that, because uh, otherwise Charles is going to fall asleep. He's desperately trying to keep himself awake because he's been on a 26-hour flight to get here, and uh, basically four flights, um, which is an amazing uh, feat in itself. And now you have to say something intelligible and intelligent and funny, but as you always do, so you're going to have to get up there and start tapping away. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, but as, um, all right, they are taking that seriously about a one minute uh, break, so I'll, I'll say something in a minute. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm very Just on the technology, the, the... I've been working in the time. Is that her? Is that her? Okay. Yes, yes. What were you doing that. with your... Been working oh, there we are, yeah. yeah. Uh, it should be yours, isn't it? Yep, that's mine. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. That... And then if I go like that... No, right, let's just go yeah. back. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, great. that's great. Right. Thank you very much. Are you coming on the trip? Yeah. Great. No, no, but I, I'm doing it now until one before the bus leaves. I will also have the Amrit Dynamic here and open. I will have courses on advanced level this year at Julian University. And I, I work with landscape architects and performing arts. And when I was just really maybe they will come to us. Maybe. Sorry. 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 Give a lecture, uh, maybe. So where is it? It's it's this autumn and, and next spring, so I'm planning it now. So it was just like a dream, you know, yeah. when I heard you. Where will it be? It will be in Stockholm. Of course, yes, yes, yeah. I, I don't know. It, they, it, you would give a lot because you know when the landscape architects and designers meet in the performing arts, yeah. they're working with meeting places, they're working with companies and participants rather than audience, and they could work. Yeah, and they need to leave their yeah. yeah, and that's how I've been working in some time. So it's in Stockholm, it's which organisation? It's the so Junior Arts, the U University U of the, the, the University of Arts, Stockholm constantly. Oh, University right. of Arts, which is the Great. further yes. opera academy. I gave, I gave one, I've given one lecture in Stockholm but for the um, for the Professional Association of Architects. And my I friend uh, Shide Shagan was yeah. there involved. She's right. now moved to Yeah, now this is the, this is the we are educating directors, actors, mm -hmm. circus artists, yeah. choreographers. Yeah. And this course is a free course on advanced level, so mm -hmm. I will be working with artists. That sounds like a so what are you what particularly would you like? I, 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 I just, I need to think. Yeah. But when I heard you, yeah. I just felt that you know, if you could come in a room with them, yeah, because yeah, you yeah. would connect with us with the project, for example, that you are describing the last one is something very interesting. Mm. Because what you are describing there, I think, is, I mean, when we leave our conventions mm. as uh, performing artists mm. and architects, landscape architects, they are very working on yeah. And you talk about participation, this could also be a project, you know, mm. when you leave your box mm. and you go together and see. Mm. So, and, and I'm not sure for the project. I mean, those are the two main projects that I've, um, more recently, I've done, I've done as curated projects. Yeah. But I've got a lot of other uh, projects that I can talk about 
already that I talk about in lectures a lot, but other people's work. Yeah. Um, Elemental and Tyroni in um, Chile, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, then the work of the Centre for Ur Urban Pedagogy in New York, where they work with high school students. Um, and then they work with um, street vendors and all sorts yeah. of other people. Yeah. So I will have a look at the book, the one, the first one, the record was in the Recoded City. Yes, I will do that. I had the ESPN. Where was it gone to? Somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well. yeah. You have the book. I was just <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. participatory projects, ah. um, you know, raising questions at every yeah. stage, what you should do, how do you prepare for the legacy, yeah. what, how do you prepare for the fact that you... Okay, so the, uh, the last speaker we have is uh, Charles Landry, and I think if there's uh, one person who you probably do know in this uh, list of speakers, it is Charles. Um, it's good to hear we're, we're awake, um, and uh, now we have to be attentive again. And uh, I mean, asking Charles to speak in, a, in, a, in an event like this is, is like opening for a, not one tap, but several taps. You never quite know what, what is going to come out, because he produces uh, things constantly, and uh, is rethinking all the time. 
although he has kept on the same, you might say, track, the same, the same, the same um, direction for the last uh, more than, I suppose, 30 years. Um, and he was, um, his Creative City publication was really, at its time, um, a, a, a document or a, um, um, a collection of thoughts, which is really one of the most um, impressive, but also the most important for many people, among others, myself, um, uh, uh, some 25 years ago, I think it was. When was it actually published? Well, uh, the, the big one in 2000, the smaller one with Franco in whenever it was, 95 or so. It was 95, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the year before I was doing the Cultural Capital. I think I actually came there to do that. And, and, and Franco told us yesterday this idea of the creative city. You heard it first mentioned in 88. Was it 88, you said? Oh, no, it was actually 1990. 1990, all right. And that was something to do with maybe with Glasgow. I'm not quite sure. Anyway that's, anyway, that's another time, that's another time. Okay, Charles is back to tell us uh, what's happened in the meantime and with his many different, uh, different publications. And this idea of the civic city in a nomadic world sounds really enticing and really interesting. But you've also, you also at one point talked about we're not going to get anywhere with this, with this alternative planning, alternative future thing unless the bureaucracy starts to think differently. So you made a publication on that, which I also thought was really interesting, and talking about how it really is important to engage with the bureaucrats, engage with bureaucracy, and actually talk about how to make that creative. And that was a discussion we also had yesterday, very much whether to like turn your back on the bureaucrats and go separately, or to actually infiltrate and still believe in it. So you'll probably be touching on that as well. And the other thing you might be touching, what was the other thing, Charles? The psychology in the city, which I just mentioned, is about how you have to understand the city is a very, very complex uh, thing, but actually the, you might say, meta-psychology of the city is always really irrelevant. So I'm not quite sure where you're going to start and end, but it seems as though you're on the right track with the future. And um, who is that sitting there? It's at the Olympic Park at the end of the Olympics. Okay, all right, that's great. All right, okay, well, thank you very much for flying all that way, and thank you very much for coming back. And you know Helsinki quite a lot, and also ESPO, because you've been actually guiding their thoughts on their cultural strategy, I believe. Okay, good. All right, thank you, Charles. Well, thank you very much. As you can imagine, I love being here, and this place in particular is like a zen ugh, out there. It's fantastic. Um, anyway, I apologize not for coming earlier. Of course, I would have preferred to be here all the time. Anyway, that's life. Uh, so I'll just go through a bit of a thing. I mean, basically, we all know that the world is moving faster, we're eating faster, we're walking faster, we're trying to think faster. Whether we're being clearer or not is a completely different question, as we all know. And this whole idea of the civic city and the magic world in one sentence is, where do we belong, or I belong, or where do I, what's my identity, etc., when everything is on the move. So where do I belong? when everything is on the move and perhaps there's less stability than there was before. And I've tried to put this together in this civic city in the nomadic world and you can see in the cover there's a sort of fracture in the picture and it's that fracture that I'm so interested in is how that could be healed. Easy to say, of course very difficult to do. And this movement is absolutely astonishing. This is at the end of the UN Quito Habitat Movement meeting, which is every 20 years, as you probably know. And what that did as its main conclusion, and you know obviously the UN is a national entity, nation states, for the first time at a global level, I mean all of you have already thought about this for 20 years, said it's really cities that they're important hubs that will probably find many of the solutions uh, of the problems that we, we, we are creating. And they had then a manifesto with a lot of words, 10 main points, which you all know of, so I'm not going to tell you, you know, inclusive, etc., etc., etc. And, but one of the issues which is very interesting in uh, Quito is that power, corruption, money, all of these words that are so important were never mentioned once. 
And all, and so never, it was never asked, well, why is it not like this? We all roughly know the types of places we want to live in, but that question was never answered, and that was very sad. But anyway, this image is just trying to reflect on the fact that there are a hell of a lot of people moving around all the time. And here is just arriving or leaving from Shanghai Station. And so, so this, when I began to see these images, I kept on thinking, images, experiencing them, I kept on thinking, shit, what's going on? And that's also why Chris Murray and I, some of you know Chris Murray, uh, we've been obsessed a bit about, is about we affect the city and the city affects us. It's so bloody obvious that it does. And this is a psychological dimension to this. But if you look at city making, the subjective, the emotional, all of that is never really fully inside the city making process or the disciplines. Occasionally people have a study about environmental psychology or so on, but it's never really embedded inside and it never really touches upon uh, what is happening inside the brain as we experience Experience these environments and as we all know as we walk around there are some environments that say yes to us but some say no and that's why I th think and feel that everybody is a city maker because everybody has some view along that spectrum I know I'm simplifying between the yes environment and the completely no environment but certainly people have begun to to wake up to these sorts of things um, but not enough um, that, 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 that's what I would conclude there. But I think the big issue, or the central issue, or one of them, is of course, as we know, and I'm sure Franco, I can just imagine Franco yesterday going along like this, the world is turning to its darker face, apprehension is in the air, uh, whatever, the zeitgeist is one of rising anxiety, the grey zone disappears, which is obviously true that the grey zone is disappearing between, um, you know, the black and white. It's everything is black and everything is white. And so, of course, this is, this is not really fun and is really difficult. But one thing that I felt was always quite interesting in that context, because obviously, in a sense, the creative city idea and notion is to try and say the glass is half full rather than half empty. And so even though all of these things are going on, uh, it's important to see how we can recapture, because in this recapturing, when the grey zone disappears, is when we feel at ease with ourselves, and that's really what the psychological work shows us, our social self comes out much more. The fact that we want to then connect in a, a certain ways. When we feel overwhelmed, our tribal self takes control. And so it's always a battle between our social self and our tribal self. And of course, we've noticed politically that the tribal self has taken over more. And I was always inspired by Patrick Geddes, just this quote that is here. Uh, a city is more than a place in space. It's a drama in time. And I think we all know that because all of you are sort of city investigators. You wander around cities and we can see that drama. And I suppose the four big points within this civic city nomadic world business is that the world is in motion. And I'll try and elaborate that in a, in a minute. But of course, the city is in motion. It's always being made and remade continuously. And in that making and remaking, of course, these destructive processes, some of which are good and most of which or many of which are bad, is really interesting to explore. And I, it took me about 35 years to work out one sentence, which I'm about to tell you, which is creativity is a renewable resource. Heritage is non-renewable. Obviously, its interpretation can be renewed. But it's precisely the balance between these, working these through, these tensions, which I believe does create great city-making, because, of course, it's not about either or. One obviously has to develop in, in one way or another. 
I'm not saying you do this, this happens to be Honingen, which is a city in the making, in a spot which is actually very old-fashioned. But the third thing about the city in motion, the world in motion, is of course in how do you generate places of encounter? And when I say places of encounter, it can be of course that public space, but it can of course permeate into that ever more private space that leaves behind it. And then the fourth question I'm asking myself is, okay, we're in this moving situation and we've got these places of encounter. How do we then create a place of empathy where that question that I said about our social self or our tribal self, that hopefully the social self comes more into prominence. So let's look at this a bit more closely as a totality. We have, I think, the return of the nomads. Of course, there was always a nomadic life, and we fantasize about some aspects of old-fashioned nomadism that is disappearing incredibly fast. But there are new nomads, and it's not just the hipsters, of course, we'll come to those in a minute, but it's nomads in all sorts of sense. When we move from one place to the next, the question is, what are the places we're moving to? And as you all know, the dynamics, the global dynamics of cities leads to a series of places that you could call vortex cities, where like a maelstrom, it sucks in often the more interesting people, perhaps, not necessarily so, the more ambitious, definitely so. It sucks in finance and so on. And what that's done has completely transfigured the way the urban global system works. So if we just, for a moment, just restrict ourselves to Europe, of course, it is a global phenomenon, uh, you see certain places, London is obviously one, but the Berlins, the Amsterdams, now the Lisbons, and soon the Athens are sucking in everything. And those processes create a completely new form of pressure, which I'm involved in, in something called Cities Under Pressure, because of the speed at which that's happening. And obviously one of the main points is the, 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 the absolutely astonishing speed of global capitalism as it sucks itself into those cities, particularly Chinese and, and Russian finance, which is buying up whole areas which is creating immense problems in cities, as you know. So that's just one movement. But the question about these people, these individuals, these of many of us probably represent some of these individuals, is we leave from, let's say, a smaller place and we go perhaps to this vortex city. Will we go back? to that smaller place, to that secondary tertiary, et cetera, et cetera, city. Which is why it's so important, for me at least, because the way the urban system works, and obviously technology helps, is that those other places that are not those become as interesting as possible. And there's a lovely project in Germany called Happy Locals, where one of the key guys in Berlin who invented, founded Trezor, which is one of the big clubs like Berghain, you'll probably know those, has got this project called Happy Locals, which is trying to keep all of these folks that are apparently so interesting back in their small localities. So the question for a city planner, for example, in terms of identifying where are we, is really to ask what is this churn between these people who are coming in and out? Are the interesting people only going in, interesting in quotes, to those hub cities, or are they also coming back to the others? And this question of the talent churn, or the churn, is an indicator that is never used, but it's so easy to identify. You just need to ask people, are people leaving or coming? etc etc and so these old and new nomads come in very different variations and if you just look at the city you can see them here this is, happens to be Berlin but what I liked is this backpacker guy has got something all these cities on his bed Vienna and the other edge you can't see it is Sao Paulo by the way just so you know um, etc and you know you see them in airports this happens to be a, this Copenhagen it doesn't matter where they are and when you look at these people, this is Istanbul, you can see the whole working arrangements are changing. And so suddenly and slowly, we know this already, of course, we're, we're, we're saying, 
the classic corporate structure that we're so used to is not necessarily the place where many people want to be. And I caught this guy, and what was so interesting, you know it's a coincidence when you're obsessively taking photos, suddenly I saw that later he had a bag called Roots, and this <laughs> exemplified for me everything about this sort of movement that we're talking about. But what is quite interesting is within this movement, and we'll be much more specific <laughs> shortly, even banks are changing. This is the main bank in Antwerp. Antwerp is quite an interesting place, as you know, quite big, 600,000 people. And this is the main bank. And the first three floors of this bank is this. So the bank, you cannot see the bank anymore. The bank is somewhere else. It's up there because the bank realizes that if it's going to connect with the sort of people it needs to generate the resources ultimately, it needs to connect with them and create spaces for them. The new main Deutsche Bank in Berlin, for example, you would think this, this is a yoga meditation zone. Uh, you've got no bloody idea what this is. You come in and it's sort of very cool, and yes, okay, or what's going on? And then somewhere in the background, of of course, there's someone who says, yes, do you want a loan or won't give you a loan? <laughs> but you, you know what I'm getting at. But these spaces could be uh, also, of course, uh, a library. And of course, as you see, what I'm talking about is the, the importance and significance of third places, neither home nor, nor, nor work but also the street, and that's why the public realm is so important. But more seriously, there are more other people uh, moving around. The guest workers, we all know that in the UAE, United Arab uh, Emirates, only 14% of people are actually Emiratis. The majority, more than 75%, are from the Indian subcontinent. And they are, of course, they're not citizens, they're well, they're not citizens, full stop. Um, they live in encampments. If you've been to these encampments, you know, it's all a bit sad. They go home perhaps once every two years, etc., etc. Their passport is taken away, etc., etc. And then, of course, there are the 80 million refugees. So when we talk about the world in movement, we often simply focus on the refugees. They're incredibly important, but there are 80 million of those, then the plus 10 million stateless people, or often quite a few of them, are in airports. You've been there, there's a couple of cases of people living in an airport for two years because they're not, they're completely stateless. But in terms of when you add all the types of people that are moving, and we'll come to these other types in a min minute, some people say it could be a billion people moving at any moment. So the refugee is incredibly important, but it's only one segment of that. They may end up in all sorts of contexts, like here, again in Istanbul, they'll earn their money in all sorts of ways, and you know much more about this than I do. But a very significant proportion of people who are on the move are students, and it was so wonderful uh, that, uh, you know, Umberto Eco wrote about the Erasmus programme and say this is the best programme in the universe because it's creating some sense that we're understanding each other. And then there was a study, you perhaps heard about it, I, I, I sort of jumped for joy when I read this, I didn't read the study, I read about it, which said, apparently, it's an EU study, which says a million children have been born because of of Erasmus. Now isn't that amazing that that has created a level of intercultural understanding at one point because far more people who go on Erasmus programs marry or fall in love or do something whatever with people from a different culture. Now that of course sounds wonderful at one level but it's also wrenching it's wrenching because of where was my home, whose home am I going to go to, and so on. And so that's why I feel, although we, we love perhaps here in this room, this sense of that diversity and movement, at the same time it, it, it is back to that question, where do I belong when everything is on the move? And of course one of the biggest, we just, we didn't see Chengdu, this is Chengdu by the way, uh, Chengdu sorry, forget Chengdu, this is just a typical tourist. Um, the tourist movement is perhaps the most overwhelming of 
the, these movements, and that is for all sorts of reasons, just to you know have fun and explore, but of course of beauty and health. Um, you probably all know the world capital of, well, butt lifting is Brazil, as you know. There's lots of beauty tourism, Costa Rica. There's countries that have vast industries on this, Poland for dentistry, Hungary for dentistry, and so on. So there's a hell of a lot going on. And then there's, of course, a darker side to tourism that, that, that you all know about. But what I find so interesting, and I don't know if you do too, is the promise of this globalization was diversity. The reality is so often sameness. If you look at these buses, they're all the same company. <laughs> what is it? Madrid, Sydney, London, Toronto, Berlin, Istanbul. So there we are, all in the same buses, going around, owned by the same company, on a city sightseeing tour, which is fine at one level, but I'm just saying that question of the promise of diverse, uh, globalization was diversity, the reality is sameness. Coca-Cola has 30 million outlets in the world. When Coca-Cola entered China in a big way, the CEO said, when he was speaking that to the then president, saying we must try and get 8 million Coca-Cola outlets in China which is quite something. I mean, eight million, if we just put eight million dots here, that would be quite a lot of dots. And of course, there are other things, you know, obviously McDonald's, 35,000 of them, etc., etc. So there we have people on the move. We have products on the move, brands on the move. We have goods on the move. And there are more goods coming, of course, from Asia than here, which is why we have so many container cities in Europe, because there's so many empty containers, because we've got nothing to send them ba send back. No, actually, container cities are great, but you... You get the idea, they're very cheap to buy. And of course, something that is particularly on the move, and I'm not going to tell you which Italian town this is, is crime and criminality. The speed of criminality, if you look at the statistics of crime and the big uh, mafias, you know, the Russian, one big Russian mafia group is actually the biggest, then of course there are the various Italian ones that collectively are nearly as big, and then the Mexicans. So that is again on the move. I'm just trying to give you a headache, sorry, about all this movement, so sorry about this. Um, and so, so, so that is happening, and much of that is happening in nanoseconds. Uh, my, my designer was hacked, and he said, he was trying to obviously establish, you know, what was the source of it, and within about 12 hours, whoever was doing the work had shifted from Egypt, where it started, to India, back to Russia and over to the States. So whoever this was, was hacking in a very sophisticated way within nanoseconds. And then, of course, not to forget, pollution is on the move as well. So obviously, we're, as we all know, we're interconnected. And this nanosecond business I was talking about, the hacking, is also to do with, obviously, global financing. There was a line built between New York and uh, Chicago, some sort of fiber line, and it cost, I think, 300 million, anyway, a vast sum of money, just to reduce the speed of the transaction by a fraction of a nanosecond, so whoever the trader was, in that instance, in that automated way, could, could, could react. I'm only saying this because this is the world we are living in and this is the world that is so out of control. This is the world that is incredibly difficult to feel that I have some sort of sense of, you know, I can affect things. And then, of course, if you're rich, citizenship is on the move. The cheapest form of citizenship in Europe, as you probably know, is Cyprus. The cheapest in the world is the Dominican Republic. Um, anyway, you can buy citizenship uh, if, you, if you want, so you don't have to go through all that hassle of eight years living somewhere. And then, of course, English is on the move. And at one level, again, it's back to this point, it's great to communicate in various languages, uh, sorry, in that language called English, but what about those other languages? What about the Finns here? Are you expressing yourself with your full self as you speak in English? Could you say it more subtly if we were all speaking Finnish, etc., etc.? So again, all of these things, as we know, 
are good and bad, and this is creating tensions in Berlin. I'm only mentioning Berlin half the time is because I happen to be living there for the moment, is that there's a big reaction to the cafes where you can't, people can't even say thank you. They can't even say danke. You know, there are people there who don't speak one word of German. And Soho House, so cool, Soho, um, you're supposed, all the people in Soho House in Berlin are not allowed to speak German. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Um, so there are two sides to all of these stories, but perhaps the biggest move of moves is the one between the physical and the virtual reality. And that move, as you know, is incredible. It's obviously only just begun, and as it says here in Dublin Library, we spend more minutes in our virtual worlds than outside. So what I'm really saying is all of these things are happening in a way that is happening more rapidly. And the, perhaps the most important one is the one I've just mentioned, which is the dramatically immersive effect of the digitized world that is immersive, all embracing, all consuming, yet also fragmenting. And it's always these things, these balances that we all know about. The fact that, of course, as you know, what happens with swiping and all of that, again, a psychological thing, is it releases dopamine in the brain, which is why we are so compelled to look at our mobiles, and God, I put it over there, uh, all the time. Because there's a deep stuff happening in the brain, which is making this all compelling. And of course, this is a dramatic breakthrough in every sense, which you know about. And it's quite interesting, of course, Google controls this. This is the Sydney Biennale. I bet they didn't realize I'd use this picture to show their dominance, which you get sucked into the Google train, um, into this Google world. But of course, that's why I thought it was so wonderful that the My Data movement, which you know about, which has a Finnish foundation, I mean, the, the big guys, girls who are into that, the first World Congress of the My Data movement was here in, in Helsinki, in Helsinki Espo area. Um, so saying, I decide who gets the data, not necessarily you. But nevertheless, this big data, we cannot hide from it. Of course, it's incredibly powerful. It allows all the sort of great things that happen, for example, in, in this Helsinki Espo region here. But when the biggest hotel chain in the world, Airbnb, owns no hotel rooms, when the biggest taxi company in the world, Uber, owns no taxis of its own, when the biggest media producer in the world, Facebook, produces none of its own media, then we know that the world has dramatically transformed, which is why people, of course, talk about the fourth industrial revolution. And to repeat the sentence again, it has only just begun. But within all of this, of course, it allows, I think we might be visiting, I'm not, I'm not sure if we're visiting the startup sound or in Alto in a minute, but of course, part of all this enables the startup uh, sector to, to operate. It enables the sharing economy because, of course, if we only on average use a hammer 1% uh, of the time or a car on average, I think 12% in Europe, of course, it enables that sharing to happen. And it was so interesting when in 2000 Helsinki was capital of culture, they had shared bikes, but because the technology wasn't good enough at the time they kept on being stolen whereas now it's much more trackable and so on so that's enabled this this is Turin where you can do bikes cars vans and so on and all enabled through the phone as we know so in all of this how do we connect shallow and deep my personal view and I may be wrong is that ultimately the civic comes from a hell of a lot of small, often shallow, small incidental encounters. And it could be one of these encounters that start like in, in this particular place here. The encounter, so 
to some extent, we use big words like community, and I think community is obviously important, but when I think of its beginnings, leaving aside that if you're in a village you've got no choice, it's often these small incidental things that build into a bigger story. And that can be in all sorts of ways. I'm only showing this because this is in fact precisely the street where the bomb in, in Istanbul happened, that that trust that is being ex exhibited here between police people and those residents is of course now in these newer contexts actually uh, endangered. And this leads to some extent to all sorts of potential uh, uh, parallel lives. And it's on the one hand, as, as we all know, that if we are a community, let's say Somali, the taxi driver yesterday was a Somali, and I asked him, who does he know? And he said, well, I'm 32. I tend to know only Somalis as my friends, but my younger cousins who are 15, they are connecting very strongly with Finns and, 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 and so on. But so we all understand that one often wants to have one's in-group, but in the city, the city, of course, in theory, is also a place of, of connection. And the stark examples we know everywhere, this is, of course, Jerusalem, where, where those fractures are so dangerous. So it's really about how to avoid that, which is back to my point, about how do we create places of encounter. And these, of course, this is all cultural projects, and I'm sure you've discussed those all over the last few days. And how here, this is a video shop in Penang, so don't worry, um, but how do you bring these different views together that are often have views of life that are fundamentally, fundamentally uh, different? So in this that I'm describing, this nomadic world, some people think, of course, it's completely invigorating, and others think the opposite, which is why we have that sense of apprehension is in the air, the world is talking, to, turning to its darker face, and so on. But if you add it all together, I think we are, or the world is, in the midst of being completely redesigned. And the question really, in all its facets, politically, legally, because a lot of what I've said has massive legal implications. And the question is then, what is our view, our vision of where next? And given the technological side of things, you know, I didn't talk about artificial intelligence and so on, but that's why I'm saying it's only just begun, is how to keep the human perspective uh, center stage. And that can express itself in all sorts of ways. I happened to be in Antwerp the day after that uh, French outrage. And this is the museum. And I think in that museum, what happened was the rabbi and the imam both together collectively entered that museum and this thing lit up, which is, of course, a digital process, an artistic process, which was incredibly emblematic at that moment. And so I think what we're really talking about is how in a world that for so long has been ego-driven, and of course we know the, the, the Western notion of the individual and all of that, is how can we do things that is beyond the self while still feeling okay about being myself, not pretending we're all so lovey-dovey and, and, and so on. And it was quite interesting. I think when the, the, the fatter Creative City came out in 2000, I, I wrote something and I said, the contours of the next wave. And in it, I said, the next wave is civic creativity. And civic creativity is a form of imagination applied to public purposes uh, that uses the entrepreneurial spirit we associate with individuals with that sense of a bigger whole, that sense of wishing to bend the market to bigger picture purposes. And that, to me, as we know, and Franco will have gone through this story, obviously this Creative City thing started very much with a focus on art as art and then has widened out, and for me, it's very much now also about the bureaucratic stuff. 
But how do we see that? How does the environment speak to me in such a way, because we're back to psychology, that I then feel I want to be back and be civic? And one of the things I've noticed, when there is generosity, public generosity in space and place, and you can feel that generosity, psychologically people are at the edge more likely to be friendly, nice, or whatever, positive, than its opposite. And you can see these signals. This is just somewhere in, 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 in Ireland, and that's a movement, you know, the random act of kindness movements. And, of course, the big question in all of this is, will the fragments ever make a bigger whole? Will these fragments, all these lovely examples that we know and, uh, that, that, that are happening everywhere, and when you take a helicopter view of them, you feel the world is really transforming and it's not got a darker face, it's got a lighter face. <laughs> However, what are the organizational systems that bring the fragments together, that they're powerful, when political parties and all of these other systems and institutions have broken down how does one bring the fragments together when we know that with the right attitudes and the right atmosphere, this can, can happen? And I just think this is quite interesting. This woman was called Shahana or something. Uh, she's Indian, and she said, free hugs. And I thought, oh, shit, I'm embarrassed. But I do want to take a photo of her. What do I do? So I hugged her. And appropriately, this was at Frankfurt Airport, where she's offering free hug, hugs, and that sort of symbolized all this nom 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 nomadic bit. But there are other examples, and I'm just, you know, slowly going through a couple. Is, is Bologna, and you've heard the, probably many of you know, the Bologna Regulation of 2014, which is about the urban commons, which is setting a framework, a public framework, where facilities are jointly managed by citizens and the authorities. This has been copied by many and has been inspired. It inspired, uh, anyway, a lot of people, doesn't matter, just look it up. Um, you know, in Portugal, in uh, other countries as well. And that, again, is something that sets a framework within which, of course, projects can happen. But that's why I'm saying that ultimately, yeah, we want the project, but you want sort of legal mechanisms that are entrenched and embedded that make this, this that normalise this. Otherwise, it's always just a project. Oh, it ended at the project. It was a very interesting project. Thank you very much. I was part of a project for two months. Thank you very much. But having something where you are then, in this particular case, a joint manager of a facility, in theory forever, creates a totally different context. Here's another example. I mean, these are just snapshots, and I'm, I'm sorry, but my main point about it is really this question of this political. This is in Bogota. This is a hip-hop group which, as you can see, is about hip-hop for peace. And they really taught me a lot because I somehow felt hip-hop was only aggressive and all of that. But these guys there talk, told me about the roots. But it's intergenerational hip-hop. And it's also men and women and all of that, girls and boys and stuff like that. And their whole aim in this favela is actually to generate peace through hip-hop. Sounds very contradictory. But it, it, it's not. And you will, of course, know Medellin. Well, um, 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 anyway, you know Medellin and you know it's turned and become the poster child of urban reinvention. And the, funny enough, the mayor of Medellin was where I was yesterday. And what he said is two incredibly important things because everybody was saying, why can't we do this? And why can't... You can imagine what they were saying. Why is the UN Habitat Agenda not happening? And he just said two things. He said, interestingly enough, and this is in contrast to Britain as an example, we do own the electricity and the water company. And because of the profits of the electricity and the water company, we can do things like build these escalators, like build these fantastic libraries you know about, which have been, you know, all of this stuff that has helped helped reduce climate because we 25% of our income comes fr fr from that that's point one and secondly it's no surprise he said the only important thing is we made a political political decision to give the poor the best 
The moment we decided to give the poor the best, plus a few other hundred things, that thing about the violence began to turn around. So in the end, uh, as you all know, we are talking politics. And then I do want to mention your region because this thing, which uh, is not a thing, of course, um, it, I don't know what to call it because it's in Helsinki, as you know, and it was built in the world design capital. So what do we call it? Do we call it a reflection space? Do we call it a what? But I've been in there many times. And this is social services and the Lutheran church. You'll correct me, Timo, if I'm wrong. Yeah, you're nodding, yeah. And if you go in there, sorry, if you haven't been in there, go in there immediately, but slowly. <laughs> and that, to me, although there's nobody there, is actually generating that feeling that I could be or wouldn't mind being with someone else, which is back to my point about the civic, that which we do together. And anyway, so these signals of the civic you see everywhere. They're building the new metro here, here in Berlin. And even these tiny things, this, is, this goes on for 500 meters with different images just going down. So you could call it street art, or you could call it urban messaging, or trying to generate this spirit of generosity. In other words, what am I saying? I'm saying in simple terms, the city is a communications <laughs> device it talks and speaks through every fibre of its being. So much of what it says is obviously a bit not too good, but what it could say could be interesting and could generate the dialogues, that sense, and this is here, this is Lisbon, as you can see, the city of tolerance at a point where Jews were, were, were killed and, 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 and so on. So in all of this, and I'm just thinking about what I've learned over the years, I mean, I don't know if I've learned anything, but if there are five points that I think are important beyond people wanting to have a job or, or you know, just have some basic income. And these constants seem to me that people want anchorage, the familiar, the tradition, heritage, whatever, all those words that are about that that is and was. Who am I? The tree that is still there whatever, the house that is still there. But then they want the opposite. They want possibility, can do, choices, option. They want this place. So this great place has anchorage, possibility. I can make more of myself. I can be connected internally and externally to the outside world in very, very var varieties of ways. I can have some sort of sense of growth, personal growth. I can become and be the full sense of what I could be. And fifthly, I mean, they don't say these words exactly, but I'm abstracting, and I think this is what people are saying. They want inspiration. And inspiration simply means that you can lift yourself up to, into another register. That inspiration may historically have been the church. But of course, the sort of projects that I gather I see in that program that you're doing, the art artists and so on, could equally be that, that lifts up into a different register. And that register could simply mean that I understand things better, but it could also mean I lift my sights. So yes, it is about the past and all of that. It is about all of those things. It is about possibilities. It's of course because the city in its essence is a place to meet, to talk, to do things, and then occasionally to sort of do something a bit extra. And the inspiration thing, I'm back, I'm just using the visual version of inspiration, could be something like this was an old library in Rio de Janeiro, which just in a very cheap way was redone. And when you went inside, you just could feel that this is a place, this is a library reinvented. This is not the library as the dull place that so many talk about. about. So where does that leave us? How do we create these conditions for people to be and to become their full selves. You know, it's easy for me to say these sentences, bloody easy, I, I know that. The, and the question is then, how is that relates to the identity? But I hope what I've tried to say is to be their full selves, is to try to be the more their social selves rather than their tribal selves. That's really, and then I'm saying once, once more, our social self, then a number of things can happen. Now, city making, 
is in fact a contested art. It took me a long time to think this through. I know it's obvious perhaps to you. Of course, city making is a contested art. Planning is mediation. So often planning is defined as something else, but the planning today, the discipline of planning, which is obviously varied, it's not only physical planning, is essentially about a mediating difference. Is, and the examples we heard this morning from Lucy were partly about mediation between different people who didn't know each other and so on. And then I saw this, and when I, I nearly said, uh, this just sort of lifted me into the sky. This is in Zurich, and they're regenerating this area where all the Ebays, Amazons are up this Zuri West. And there's this hotel called the Renaissance Hotel. And there was one person, one artist who resisted in that building. And he put resistance in the same writing as the Renaissance Hotel. And that is the essence of urban transformation, that problem. Now that guy had so much problem that in the end, unfortunately, this building was just torn down a year ago because he gets, had so much hassle and let himself be bought out. But nevertheless, he provided the world with this image <laughs> that summarizes the essence of these places. And the places where I think interesting things happen are often quite unusual. You look at it first sight. This is the old Philip factory in Eindhoven, Stripes, and you see that and you think, oh, that's cool, that's a hipsterish area. But the company that owned that, Trudeau, that did this transformation of these parts of the old Philips factory also owned a hundred, a thousand rather, a thousand buildings of the Philips workers over there. The school in that place, because Philips declined, everything declined, was shut down because heroin was being sold, all of that. You can imagine the context, etc., etc., etc. And he said, we need a game changer, this guy called Tom Alsom. And he said, OK, I will get some students and offer them a deal that they can't refuse, which is you can live there and 180 accepted, it's 180 houses, and you get such a special financial deal that you will really want to do that. But the deal from your side is that you give 20 hours a month to this community, teach them Dutch, teach them mass, teach them art, whatever it is. Four years later, that school and this area is completely transformed, and the school was voted the best apparently in Brabant, which I don't know how many people live in Brabant, a few million and stuff like that. So quite often, the game changer, the cultural understanding that creates the game changer is odd things, like in this case, do a deal, you get it cheaper, but you give 20 hours to do something. So are these spaces and places, I don't know why I've got this picture of Nokia inside the building, I think just because I'm in Espo. Um, why have I got that? I don't know. Just to say that of the places and spaces, this is another place in Paris, that we think are the places where the vibrancy happens, often do not look like this, even though they look beautifully sanitized. And here, just in passing, is that bank, the Deutsche Bank, the entrance to that bank that feels like a, 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 a yoga center that I took, uh, said before. So. That's why all of this, these tensions between the construction industry that build things like that La Défense I just showed and all of that, is why, of course, we see this, the, 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 this resistance. And this is why I think, and what I like about uh, this event you've got, is that city making is a cultural project. Again, easy to say, uh, uh, d difficult to do. And of course, that cultural literacy, I think you're using the, uh, the, the, the word culture much broadly, more broadly here, is both there to decode, but also ultimately perhaps to, to, to inspire. And the event I was at yesterday, you know, in passing, you know, I, I kept on seeing the word cultural planning. I think we made a mistake, and it's quite often your mistakes you can only see retrospectively. We should never have called it cultural planning, it was a wrong word. It should have been called planning culturally. I mean, in English, cultural planning, planning culturally. And I never use the word cultural planning, although I agree with 
the essence of what it's trying to do. But I believe it's planning culturally, which is to do with this literacy, this understanding of the essence of where people come from, where they are, where they might wish to be and, 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 and become. And what was interesting, the event I was at yesterday, which was the Inter-American Development Bank, which is part of the IMF, which sounds very dull, there they have a division which is called the Culture and Creativity Division linked to urban development. Now, if you just think about the processes of trying to get a bank like that to install a division that has that title. You may criticise lots of things about it, but I think that's at least a step forward. So in terms of this cultural planning, culturally thing, have we moved forward or not? I just don't know. Some signals like that example I'm just giving now would suggest that we are occasionally moving forward. But what's so interesting is the meeting places. We all know that this big danger, which is why I talked about process, pro, uh, protest, is that the places that people want to be in now and create often look so different. This is the Holzmarkt in Berlin, which is 250 metres on the main river site on the Spray, which was transformed by a group of people, it looks like this and this, by people who owned a squatted nightclub called Bar 25, and they created such a protest that they got a series, uh, 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 an insurance company, the foundation of Abendroth, which is an insurance company, a Swiss company, to help them buy the land. So they bought the land so they could do this. This is not profit maximizing, as you can see, but there are a couple of anchors which make money to balance the books. But what there has been now is a movement which has happened here and then another part of Berlin, this is another nightclub, which is of foundations coming in and buying key properties and taking it out of the speculation market, which is back to my cities under pressure thing. Because in the end, it's all very good doing the project if you don't bloody own the thing, or at least have an angle on the assets, or, like Medellin, have enough revenue coming in to be able to have leverage over the forms of development, because otherwise it's all that pro uh, just being a protest. And the protest, of course, we all uh, 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 agree with. So there we are. We're in this movement area. Things are moving. We're in a startup area. Yes, yes, yes. All very good. What is the key element? The key element is back to what we've already known, and which is why the world's darker face is so difficult, is the city obviously needs experimentation zones. If you were a private company and someone said to you, do you have an R&D department? And you said no. They'd say, are you mad? Are you trying to go bankrupt? The city needs exactly these same experimentation zones and some of it will be rubbish, but some of it will be wonderful and some of that alternative will become the mainstream that itself will be challenged at another point and become I don't know what. Or some of the best of that that was an innovation will become mainstream, will become heritage that then needs to be connected with new innovations and so on. But that's the process, a dynamic process of city making. And I think that that really is the key issue. And that is not easy because it requires a bureaucracy firstly to agree with it and secondly to, 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 uh, to, to, to accept it. And as you all know, and I won't say anything about this, we of course moving from representative democracy to participatory democracy. And of course that's about harnessing collective community intelligence. And what's so great, of course, about Nordic countries is you've got so few populations, you better harness the whole population. If you've got 80 million, you might say, OK, let's leave 40 million behind. I mean, I'm not saying that's what countries do, but sometimes you feel they do do that. Um, so how that happens will happen in different formats. You've talked about it all over the weekend. But when we now turn to the bureaucracy, which I think needs to enable this, 
You need to move from a no because to a yes if culture, which is so incredibly easy to say, but difficult to do, because what that implies, because precisely that movement I described about the city making and the innovation labs and so on, when this is turned into legality, it becomes slightly rigid. So, for example, you have an intent or a principle but often that is a suggestion, it becomes a suggestion, a recommendation and a rule. But then when it goes into the bureaucratic process, that rule, suggestion, is treated as if it's law. And that is the danger, because what we're trying to do is shift from the... We're trying to keep intent, and that often means having the spirit of the law rather than the letter of the law. But when a structure, which is normally hierarchical and doesn't allow failure, it forces people to have the tendency to shift a suggestion into a law, which means that the systems are, are, are rigid. Added to which, of course, there is the silo thing that people here have been talking about for 30 years, so we say nothing more about it, but I was in one of these boxes and I didn't like it. And what we're then doing in this reshifting is moving from a predict and provide model, this is in terms of the planning process, which is the traditional process, to what I call elastic planning. And elastic planning is to be strategically principled and tactically flexible. What that means is there are three things I really, really, really mean, and they are completely non-negotiable. How, how I'm going to get there, I don't bloody know. In general, I know this is the direction of travel. I need to, if I've got the principle, I'm going to be all right, because I'm always guiding it via the principle which will help me uh, to do that. And this then becomes, obviously has to be added to a sort of compelling narrative of the story of a place, and I'm sure you've told lots of people like that. Uh, sorry, you've told lots of stories like that. So just to summarise in ten points what I then think this new urbanity is that has this ethics in it, and it's all stuff you know. Nothing I'm saying is anything new, but I'm just putting it together for myself is what are the lenses of that? The first, and I'm sure you've been talking about it all the time, I know Leah has, is integrated thinking, planning and acting. Uh, sorry, I mean, you've been talking about it, why, why do I need to say that? The shared commons and threats to it. Of course, this creative bureaucracy stuff. By the way, can I just tell you, uh, we're organising the first creative bureaucracy festival in Berlin with the main paper and anyone who knows any interesting bureaucrat who's had any solution to any problem, please let me know. Can you do it by... No, no, seriously, this is not a joke, yeah? This is being launched. This thing is being launched on the 28th of May at the Global Solutions Summit, which is a parallel summit to the G20. It's being launched, the Creative Bureaucracy idea and, and the festival. There's a founders meeting at the end of June with a few people to work out what the festival will be like, and in the autumn it's happening. But the only reason I'm saying it at this point with trust is because we want the examples. We need the example. The diagnosis is clear. We know the diagnosis. Everybody knows the diagnosis. It, what is the solution? Which ones have worked and failed? And the third point, obviously, cultural literacy that you've talked about. Intergenerational understanding and joint projects. These divisions, these spatial fragmentations, obviously, we need to get a, 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 a rid of. Then being eco-aware. Again, I said you know everything about what I was saying. Addressing the divides, of course we know that. Healthy urban planning. I was so inspired by someone called Hugh Barton. I'm nearly finished, by the way. Have I gone on for hours? Sorry, I just was in a sort of sorry, sorry. loop. Um, he added the word urban planning. He just put the word healthy urban planning. It's so simple. If you just always put in front of urban planning healthy, then somehow thinking about a city that makes you healthy rather than ill may be a good idea. And then the aesthetic responsibility. I just think it's so important to ask a developer, do they even know the word aesthetic, by the way? <laughs> the aesthetic responsibility 
to show this generosity and this stuff that we're talking about. And then I'm really nearly there, I promise you. Is of course, I still believe in the creative city ethos, which is basically empowering an ethos. And in one sentence is how do you create the conditions for people to think, plan, and act with imagination in creating solutions and solving problems. And then we need, of course, an invigorated democracy. But that in the context of the digital age. And I love this piece of Russian artwork. It means just really rethinking the rule system and so on. So some of that may, may or may not deal with this fault line, this fragility that I'm talking about in this nomadic world. And it is about the management of fragility. And that requires us to have this flexibility and this alertment, alertness. And so there I leave you. The conclusion for me, and again, you know, some words, five words took such a long time to think through. <laughs> the soft is the hard. It just took me so long to work that out. <laughs> that building the infrastructure is easy, but the soft is the hard. So it's not always about money. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, uh, a bit of a tour de force. Um, so, yes, uh, we're all gasping. We're all, we're all quite elated, I think. So, but um, on the other hand, we, you know, practicalities, uh, um, we have to decide now whether we're going for the creative city or whether we're going for the buses. Uh, so I'm not sure the buses are going to stay that long, so let's have a vote on it. Who's voting for the buses? And we keep to the timetable. Who's voting for the creative city and uh, talking? Passes. Just reactions. Okay, quick reactions. Let's say 10 quick reactions and that's it. So just sort of uh, get stuff bubbling and there's lots of talk about on the buses then. Will you be with us on the trip on the buses? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> We'll let, we'll let Charles be the guide on one bus and we'll never get anywhere, but we'll go round and round Helsinki talking, <laughs> which will probably be quite interesting. Uh, and we'll stop occasionally for a pee and a cigarette. Um, okay, so um, you want a couple of reactions? I think it's also, actually, it's better to take it on the buses. And it's better to take it in the afternoon at the Architecture Centre, where we have an hour where we're summing up. So let's do it like that, because um, <laughs> otherwise we're going to be in a problem. Thanks very much, Charles. Great. Okay. And Lucy's books, please bring Lucy's books back to me.